25 years after pumping iron put bodybuilding on the map, British documentary maker Louis Theroux explored the fringe world of extreme bodybuilding. This was still a pre-September the 11th world. The internet was in its infancy. Social media was non-existent. Ronnie was a few years deep into his reign as King of the Freaks. The sun was setting on the dying embers of the Weeder Empire. Arnold was on the cusp of pivoting from action star to politician. And bodybuilding was, at face value, a very different landscape. I always find it fascinating when an industry outsider documents the postmodern freak show of bodybuilding to a mainstream audience. All too often, any coverage is tarnished with unimaginative stereotypes, set against a tone of snide condescension and judgmental moralizing. As a visual spectacle, bodybuilding presents an easy target for scorn and ridicule, often doing itself no favors in reinforcing its own negative tropes. It's also fundamentally boring to anyone outside that world. Watching someone work out, eat food, and rest on repetitive loop is about as entertaining as watching paint dry, and that's an insult to drying paint. It also doesn't make for compelling viewing. To salvage anything remotely entertaining about bodybuilding to outsiders, you need to focus on the personalities, of usually which there are none, or mine the eccentricities and oddities of the sport, hooking audience attention long enough to hopefully teach them something about the actual topic. The Rue's earlier documentaries were a masterclass in exploring the weird world of American subcultures. His early episode topics range from survivalists to swingers, Nazis to black nationalists, gangster rappers to infomercial grifters. His awkward fish-out-of-water journalistic style disarms his interviewees with his deadpan delivery and genteel English charm. Theroux's willing and often innocent participation allows him to quickly establish rapport, further lowering the defences of those he speaks with. It's an approach while endearing, is also a touch manipulative and bordering on exploitative. Louis' foray into the world of bodybuilding places him squarely at its cultural epicentre. Venice Beach, California. Here he meets number two amateur in the world Guy Grundy, an interesting choice considering the range of bodybuilders Theroux could have accessed at the established mecca of Gold's Gym. The Aussie-born Grundy is fluent in the nuances of British piss-take culture, which so often eludes the majority of Theroux's usual American targets. So he's more than a match of wits in their entertaining back-and-forth exchanges. Grundy thus becomes Theroux's entry point and credible guide through the minefield of bodybuilding's opaque underbelly. Grundy presents as a guy clearly in charge of his own destiny, a testosterone fueled up and coming alpha male, living the California dream, driving a sports car, beating off women with a stick, and strutting the gym room floor like the literal cock of the walk, thigh chafing be damned. I love these first few opening scenes with Louis and Guy. The photo shoot conducted by David Paul of Barbarian Brothers fame, who's now unfortunately passed on. And the impromptu pose down to assess Louis' potential under the seriously unimpressed gaze of his bewildered manager, self-described flex broker, Mark Michalik. Grundy good-naturedly plays along as Mark reveals the commercial avenues for bodybuilders, parlaying the demand for their physical wares into the cash flow needed for the expensive upkeep of their competitive physiques. It's also here that Grundy provides the first shock insight into the sport's dark side, the commodification of their bodies. Feel your arm? Yeah, I've had other top professional bodybuilders that are gay saying, you know, there's a guy that'll pay us an X amount of money if we do stuff together in front of him. Like what? Like, you name it, just from cuddling to kissing, and the more you do, the more you'll, you'll get. Let's say you and I cuddle. And there's also the buzzing commerce of selling used workout clothing and underwear, the latter endowed with additional gifts attracting premium prices. I, I make $500 a month on um, used workout clothing. Really? Yeah, people just want to buy a used photo. Like, like dirty underwear? Yep. Now this was all before the explosion of internet commerce and OnlyFans, so you can only imagine how turbocharged this kind of trade is today. What could you get for my underpants? It would depend on what uh, special um, uh, gifts you'd give with it. And people do ask for that anything. Sword underwear, they've asked and like... You mean 
What? Soiled under anything. People ask Soiled like, as in, you've defecated in it? And your own personal flex broker is probably an app click away. Meet you, Mark Mahalik, flex broker. It's nice to meet you, Mark. Flex broker. <laughs> but the scene also alludes to the financially destitute and morally questionable nature of bodybuilding, a sport nowhere near the prestige or paydays as other professional athletes. There's the undeniable subtext that even its top-ranked competitors need to stoop to selling their sweaty, shit-stained underpants just to pay the bills. A fact which Greg Valentino discusses in his book that even Arnold may have participated in similar muscle worship sessions back in his earlier days. Louis next dives into a workout at Gold's Gym, the once iconic and proud mecca of bodybuilding. Gold's has now sadly become a shadow of its former self, losing the allure as well as any cachet it once had. Bodybuilding's globalisation has outgrown any historical sentiment or significance that Gold's Venets once enjoyed. Aspiring big-name bodybuilders no longer have to pack up their car, travel thousands of miles, and risk a throw of life's dice just to make it big in the scene, which was once pivotal in transforming mere mortals into the identifiable living gods of the earlier eras. The Rue trains under the guidance of Frank, an ex-Marine who puts Big Lou through his paces. Resembling an extra who could have stepped off the set of a Goodfellas movie, Frank's neither bodybuilder nor beefcake. But for the episode's purpose, he serves as a conduit between the two worlds. He discusses the unhealthy nature of the sport while raising another taboo, the use of steroids in bodybuilding. Considering that this was the late 90s and not the $8.6 billion industry PEDs are today, the topic of steroids was still legally contentious and a sensitive topic to openly discuss. Steroid busts were an all-too-frequent, newsworthy headline of the Times and rarely discussed as openly as they are today with such impunity. It really is a different world. The Rue also meets another gym rat, who speaks about the increased number of guys dropping dead in their 30s from steroid-related heart disease. When Louis raises the matter, we see an irked and defensive Grundy dismiss the guy as just another jealous hater. The scene highlights the common misconceptions of the often overstated dangers of steroids at the time, thanks to the barrage of anti-drug messaging and media propaganda. Everyone can remember those after-school specials or episodes which portray PEDs in a negative light, and in the minds of the mainstream, PED users were ticking time bombs of pent-up steroid rage, fast-tracking their way to an early grave. Without the information available we have now, it was an even more difficult time separating fact from fiction. Another interesting side note is the sociological research into steroid users' self-rationalisation for PED use. Grundy's take here is consistent with the documented tendency for users to downplay PED side effects and rigorously dismiss the criticism of anyone outside the subculture as ignorant, envious or blatantly hypocritical. In a humorous display of verbal gymnastics to avoid self-incrimination, Guy describes his own hypothetical use as otherwise conservative. If you did take steroids, yeah. would you inject them? Yeah. Every morning? Oh, no. It, it, some guys... But if, if I was to use steroids, I'd be a very mild user. And I have once... would have If I had have ever tried it, I would have tried it once to use a lot and, and didn't really notice a great deal of difference. Again, it's become its own cliché. High-level bodybuilders downplaying drugs as simply the icing on the cake attributing their results to hard work, dedication and genetics. Was it true in Guy's case? Perhaps we'll never know. Everyone's also probably been asked the question by someone outside the sport of why they bodybuild, and Theroux probes Grundy's motivations behind his bodybuilding lifestyle. Was Grundy inspired by the glory of reaching the pinnacle of his chosen sport, or pushing himself to new limits of potential, and self-actualization. You want to know why I started doing weights? Because I'd go to the beach and see muscular men with good-looking women. And basically I thought, well, if that's how you get good-looking women, hey, I want good-looking women. Gotta love that Aussie honesty. 
you've driven a Porsche type thing, which is the way I look at my body, because that's my ideal body, and then driving a, a lesser type of a car, which is not saying that yours is a lesser, but it's the way that I view things, you know what I mean? If you're driving a Porsche, what am I driving? <laughs> a Mini? With some racing strikes. Guy's a self-described Porsche, a car built for both show and performance. And while he acknowledges the inherent risks and negatives of the game, he doesn't promote this lifestyle to anyone else. It's here that the documentary shifts gears and Theroux pivots to an even more controversial topic of women's bodybuilding. Thanks for watching part one of my analysis of Louis Theroux's look at extreme bodybuilding. Please like and subscribe to catch part two, which I will release in a couple of days. I love the viewer comments and try to get back to everyone, so please help the channel out by leaving a comment below. Thanks for watching.